This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Valeria Tellez interviews Marinda Freeman, the author of The Grief Train, A Healing Journey of Love, Loss, and Renewal. Marinda is a lifelong spiritual student of many religions and disciplines. She has been a licensed spiritual counselor and teacher for over 20 years. Her book, The Grief Train, was the result of her personal exploration of grief after her husband died unexpectedly of a heart attack. She started a blog to write about her process and discovered that friends found solace and inspiration in reading her blog. Over a five-year period of studying grief as an emotion and mourning as a ritual and process, Marinda discovered the mourning etiquette of the 1800s that we no longer know or follow. She wrote her book in order to provide a gentle, spiritual, non-religious approach to grief as a way to help others. I discovered after writing The Grief Train that it was really an exploration of the meaning of death, of loss, Marinda says. What did my husband's death mean? What does widow mean? Marinda has had a successful event design business for 35 years. She is passionate about creating community and connection, the true purpose of every event. Marinda designs events that bring people together, where they feel comfortable, inspired, and at ease in connecting with others. She helps her clients think differently about their events for greater success and to create not just results, but memories. For me, it's all about creating beauty, what the event looks like, and more importantly, what it feels like. I create beauty everywhere, in the home, the garden, and in the food I prepare. Altars are another way to create beauty. It could be an entryway arrangement signaling welcome, peace is here, or an altar designed for a meditation space, or to honor the loss of a loved one, or used more formally as a ritual, as explained in the book. Food is another lifelong passion of Marinda's. As a chef, she has taught cooking classes, developed recipes, and was the executive director of Martha Stewart's catering business. As her husband, Mike, was also a chef, she had to include recipes in her book. Marinda has lived in beautiful Marin County, California since 1991 and raised her daughter, Esther, there. Meet Marinda on thegrieftrain.com. Here is the interview with Marinda Freeman. In your own words, who is Marinda Freeman? Uh, That would be me. Uh, I've lived on planet Earth here for a little over 70 years and have done a lot of things in my life. I'm sure the bio has given you an idea of that. Um, And I have to say that, you know, we never know what step we take that will unfold into something we had no expectation of, which was certainly my book, The Grief Train, A Healing Journey of Love, Loss, and Renewal. Uh, I never had the intention of writing a book. I just started writing a blog to explore my feelings and thoughts of mourning and grief and what the hell is a widow. Uh, And my writing group is the one that encouraged me when I started reading my blog posts to write a book. So 
here we are in this conversation. I would have never imagined. <laughs> I'm glad you did. Yeah, you wrote that book. I love the title. I know love in the sense of creativity. This is the grief train that just resonates because it's true. We never know when this the train will come to us, will arrive in our station, as you say it. The second official question is, what is grief to you, Marinda? Well, there's, let me um, speak about distinction. So yeah. there's grief and mourning, and grief is the emotion uh, that washes over us when we have lost someone. Those are, that's an emotion, a feeling. And mourning or grieving is the action that that takes, of, of many different kinds of action. So the thing to remember about grief is that there is no end. Like, you know, when people say, aren't you over that by now? Yeah. Uh, no. You know, we have to have compassion because there is no end. There is a um, probably a gentling of our heart where it doesn't hurt as much. Yeah. That has become a little more subtle. But the change that happens when someone is with you physically and then they are no longer physically around, they have taken off their earth suit and yeah. they're great, but we are left to adjust to the change. And that takes time and it takes um, work actually to do the work of grief is to dive deep into those feelings and emotions and to allow them to be with them because it's only by diving deep into them can we come back out into life. Mm. If we push against it and resist, uh, they, we'll be stuck mm. and there's no movement forward. So grief chains, but doesn't go away. Right, right. That's why I called it, that's why I called it the grief train because we don't even know we could be sitting at that station and all of a sudden it shows up and washes over us and our job is just to be with it to allow it to honor it and um know that it could be years later right. that something triggers us and there we are back at the station i guess i'll, I'll ask another question about the stages of grief do you believe them yes well um, uh, elizabeth kubler ross wrote a book called the five stages of grief and you know there's anger, there's, uh, you know, disbelief. I, I don't have them memorized, but we go through them, not in order, they're up and down. And I don't know if when grief shows up years later that it's the same, except it's the emotion. And emotion is energy in motion. And so when that washes over us, there is nothing we can do to like stop the motion of that energy of that emotion. But, um, Jeff uh, Kessler wrote a book called uh, The Sixth Stage of Grief that, came, Grief that came out last year, and that is meaning. And really, I when I read that book, I said, oh, that is what my book is about. My book is about looking at the meaning of grief and mourning. And so it was a revelation for me because it was a continuing study over the five years. I read lots of books and uh, just examining and exploring what is this um, feeling, what is this emotion, what is this state of being in grief, and what is the work to be done to move through it. Um, and I certainly have had experience with grief over time. My mother died when I was 10. Uh, I've had other people in between uh, now and back then pass away. And then my husband died suddenly. And then three years later, my sister died. So uh, the, the movement keeps coming around in different ways. And at the same time, I know they are fine. They're actually wonderful. They're in a beautiful place. But again, we are left to adjust to the change in our life living here on earth. So I guess my follow up question is about preparing for that event. Do you think it's really possible to prepare to lose someone we love? Uh, that's an interesting question. 
I don't think we can prepare um, our feelings. Right. You know, people that have spent years ministering to a loved one as they are dying of cancer, um, they're still in the living. Yeah. And when that person leaves their body and is no longer present here on this earth, that is the finality that still, even with all of what might look like preparation of you know, caring for them as they were dying, is not the same as what happens after they're gone. It's a different place. But I think we can all realize that uh, we all take that particular train. There is nobody that's going to get out of it alive, as they say. And that um, if we can have more realistic awareness of it, and also to know that it's a sacred journey when people are dying, that really we are birthing them into their next experience. And if we could keep that mm -hmm. in mind, there is a sending off in a way that um, it doesn't mitigate the grief, but it allows for an expansive awareness of what is going on. So you say the transition from this experience to another and knowing that they are well, is that a belief or is this something that you know? <laughs> That's a good question. I would say yes, it is. Both. <laughs> Both, right, Miranda? Both. Mm. All of the above. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, mm. I have studied many different philosophies and religions, and I do believe that, you know, Life is bigger than this three dimensions that we are focused on. And uh, science uh, has proven that as far as, you know, what we can actually physically see as a small uh, little segment of what's available to actually see and that other beings see. Uh, the same with hearing, um, but we can look at that from a quantum physics standpoint that, you know, uh, everything is energy and energy never disappears, it may transform, but it's still energy. So I think there's many ways we can define that, whether it's scientifically or spiritually. But um, I do believe that we are a greater, we, we are focused right now on a particular role that we have chosen to learn on this earth plane, and also how we can give to others. I mean, that is, um, I think, the, the most important way that we can look at our lives and are we benefiting others and helping others because it can't just be about me, me, me. Do you believe that there is a purpose to life as a whole for all of us as humanity? Well, I think we all have a purpose or many purposes. And I think that, you know, the thing is we we assign ourselves uh, some some roles and things to do. And then, of course, we forget all of that when we show up here. Yeah. And yeah. things unfold one step at a time, just like this book was uh, two years of writing my blog, two, three years of writing the blog yeah. post, and then my writing group saying, oh, you need to turn it into a book. So then that was another three, four years. Yeah. And um, so one step leads to another. And we don't always know what that's going to be. But, you know, I look at uh, expectation of good that, you know, it's like when our birthday is the next day and we know we're getting presents, we don't know what they are, but we know they're going to be good. So whatever they are is going to be good. So I think that applies to life. And if we have that kind of expectation, we are open to listening to guidance and what next steps we might take and open to the surprises that life can present to us. How do we learn to see gifts and miracles in every experience? Uh, good question. I, I think it starts with uh, noticing our thoughts. Uh, because, and that sometimes is very difficult for people because there's so much busyness going on in their heads. So mm -hmm. I always tell my clients when I'm consulting with them on a spiritual basis mm -hmm. to start observing the words that come out of their mouth. 
like they have a little observer sitting on their shoulder and they're watching mm -hmm. every word that comes out of their mouth because every word you speak is concrete energy going out into the universe. And mm -hmm. so you can notice, oh, I said that, and no, I, I don't really want that, cancel, cancel. Right. So if we can start noticing what words we're saying, we can then over time back up to what is our thoughts before we speak. So we can start to be mindful. Mm -hmm. That really is what mindfulness is about, is focusing on our thoughts and our inner conversations and um, I'm a firm believer in, you know, when you've got some kind of a tape going around in your head, stomp your foot and say, no, I'm not going to go there anymore and replace it with what you do want to affirm. So it's an inner practice and it's, you know, practice, practice, practice is, is how we get, you know, anywhere. So that's what I would suggest we start with. Yeah. That also reminds me of the law of attraction, some of those principles. Would that be connected? The which book? The law of attraction? Yes. Um, those are, again, saying the principles. It said so many different ways. What I love about studying different philosophies is the truth right. is explained in different languaging. So it's like looking mm -hmm. through a faceted crystal and each language helps have a greater clarity of the understanding of the truth that does that remains the same. And that sometimes we need to hear it differently for us to um, resonate with it and to understand it. How did you become a spiritual counselor and teacher? Uh, well, I, I uh, have, have been a spiritual student my whole life and uh, was raised in Christian science, which was a good foundation of knowing that uh, if there's any problem, the answer isn't out there. It's an inside job. So cracking open the books and studying, and I've always been reading this, that, and the other thing. So many different books, from Seth books to science books of quantum physics that prove the spirituality. I love Dean Radin's books from, uh, he's the IONS uh, chief scientist, proving scientifically these spiritual truths. Uh, but I, uh, after my daughter was born, I joined the religious science church in, in town, which is uh, now called Centers of Spiritual Living, which is really based on a philosophy of Ernest Holmes, who wrote a book in the uh, 20s and 30s called Science of Mind, which is really not a religion, but a philosophy. But I really liked the manner of truth that it explained. So I studied and became a religious science practitioner after four years of study and um, becoming licensed. Um, and so I have been a, a licensed spiritual counseling teacher for over uh, 20 years now. So that's just another way to express my interest and alignment with spirit. Right. Most of your clients, are they in a um, grieving process? No, it's, you know, whatever is showing up, it's not, um, it, it has, it, it's not focused on one, any one thing. It's, you know, wherever we are, <laughs> <laughs> right. it's where we are and, you know, whatever sort of shows up that seems to be a stumbling block uh, or is getting our attention. So uh, you never know what it is. And it can be something little that just in conversation shifts the thinking to seeing it totally differently. And that's what we always need to be open to. What is spirituality to you? Or what is to be spiritual? Well, I, I think it's remembering the truth of who we really are. You know, I like the saying that uh, the operating system of the universe looks like light and feels like love. So that that light love is all there is. And if we remember that uh, and come back to that truth, when we get carried away, uh, we can remember that we're all connected, we're all one, and there is no other. Uh, and that can be really uh, challenging sometimes in our experience. It goes back to practice what we know or what we want for our lives, right? Right. And practicing, you know, what are we thinking? Mm, you know, yeah. that's a silly question. What was I thinking? You know, yeah. 
it's paying attention to and noticing, you know, it's really being the observer and noticing so that we can, you know, meditation, I think, is um, sometimes described as sitting in a chair and being still. And I love uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's books, especially his book, Pieces Every Step, because it's not, it's mindfulness and meditation is in every moment. It's not, you know, the 30 minutes you're sitting in a chair, what are you doing the other 24 or 23 and a half hours of the day? And that it's just focusing on our own awareness. So being present and, you know, the, the easiest way to do that is to breathe, to remember to breathe. To focus on our breath brings us back into our body. So that's that becomes really the practice so that we can as uh, be here now, as Ram Dass said. I'm wondering if we can stay, live in such a state of mind, of being. Is that possible, Miranda? Well, I think it's uh, there's an opportunity to right. do that. Right. I think that... Uh, you know, there are monks that are doing that all the time, where if we're out in the world, it's more of a challenge as well as an opportunity for us to be mindful in every moment. I mean, that's the practice, you know, how well we do it is not a matter of saying, oh, I wasn't doing it, and you know, and making ourselves wrong as much as noticing, oh, you know, and bringing ourselves back to the present moment. I mean, I'm not there as well as anybody else, but you know, I try and remember to breathe. I also like singing because you have to breathe to sing and you have to be present to sing. So, um, you know, whether it's a chant or a song that brings you present. And so that's where I think music becomes such a connecting when people can sing because it's, it is something you have to do in the present moment. You can't be thinking something else. So 2020, we have had, we are, are having challenges and change happening. So my question to you is, what lessons have you learned from 2020? Well, I think compassion is one that we all have to grow our awareness of because there's just been so much uh, grief and mourning. I mean, so many people have died, let's just start there with COVID-19, that, you know, have not been acknowledged. Uh, we need a national day of mourning to really honor and, and remember every one of these people. But it's also mourning of just what we are not able to do, of gather with each other, connect with each other in person. We have a lot of loss that has occurred this year and that um, yes sir, we can zoom to connect with people but there's still a loss of not being able to be with each other and other things that we are um, prudently not doing right now for the safety of ourselves and for everyone else and that um, I think this is a big break uh, for everyone to stop and think differently about things because we're never going back to something normal. We're mo moving forward and it's going to be different. And we all have the ability to design that difference in something new and what we desire based on what we envision. So I think that compassion and the other quality I would bring up is resilience because resilience is the ability to have equanimity even in the midst of loss and grief and to be able to know that um, there's an ability to still move forward within all of this that's going on. Do you connect compassion to love? Well, I think love is all there is, so... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> right, in period. There we go. <laughs> it looks True. like compassion, it looks like resilience, you know. Right. Uh, and it's like light, you know, so uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we have that, you know, that that's the operating system. So everything is that reflection. But, you know, it's like the facets of the crystal. There are many different facets to that love and aspect. What do you love most about being a woman? Hmm. 
Well, that's an interesting question. I don't ask that of myself, I have to say. Um, I, I have to just speak personally. I can't speak generally. Uh, but I would say that the biggest gift for me has been um, becoming a mother. Uh, birthing a child was a powerful experience that uh, I joined a, a club of women that goes back all the way to the first women in history. I had that sense of feeling in my bones, that connection, of that ancient connection of, of women and this experience. So that would, that would be a big one for me. Have you faced any challenges for being a woman? <laughs> <laughs> what a question, right, to ask. <laughs> I have to. <laughs> of course. Uh, <laughs> You know, um, I, I have to say I am an optimist. So even uh, in uh, the face of challenges, it's an opportunity. You know, that's, that's really how I look at challenges. So um, life is full of them. I've had all kinds of wonderful experiences in my life. I've lived all over the country and I lived in Tokyo. So and I've traveled to Europe. So I've uh, I've had lots of experiences and some more challenging than others, but um, I've loved all of it because it's uh, brought me to now and given me vast experiences that many I would not have ever imagined before I could envision. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> What is the meaning of freedom to you? What is to be free? Well, I think that, again, starts as the inner question of, you know, yeah. how free are we ourselves rather than, yes, I think we are blessed in this country of the United States to have a lot of freedom. There are a lot of conversations about what it should or shouldn't be, but we do have a lot of freedoms. But I think that it really is more of an internal question of, you know, are we giving ourselves the ability to be free to be who we are? Or are we holding ourselves back? And these are uh, inside job questions that we have to examine and look at. And if we are holding ourselves back, what is that? And why is that? So we can uncover that and allow ourselves to be a greater expression of who we are, to be free to express who we are. What was the intention of writing the book, The Grief Train, A Healing Journey of Love, Loss, and Renewal? Did you gain any new insights in the process of writing the book? Oh, definitely. I gained a lot. Um, I didn't, you know, it's like you take a step forward and you start writing. And I had written most of the um chapters starting with chapter two with my blog post, but then I kept writing more as I read more, but I had to go back and write what happened when I wrote the book. So that was reliving all of the things that happened before I started my blog post. Um, when I, you know, when my writing group said, you have to turn this into a book, I had to sort of explain why I was writing this book and what happened to get to me uh, writing all these blog posts and the experiences I was having. Um, I, I would say in the process of writing my blog posts over the first two years, I did a lot of study of a lot of books. And then um, as I started writing the book, I, I had this quest, or I actually in a meditation was given this billboard um, that um, that uh, said to me, you know, I was in the meditation, it was like in a visual in my head, discarding widow's weeds. And I was like, what is that? You know, what is discarding widow's weeds? So I started looking into it and, you know, um, found a book called Widow's Weeds and Weeping Veils, a little book on the etiquette of 1800s of mourning. And uh, Widow's Weeds were what women's clothing was called because women were responsible for expressing the grief for their family and wearing black for two to four years. And the crepe, 
that they wore, the dye would start to lose its density after time. And, you know, they wore it over and over, so they called it widow's weeds. And then the indication was first you started with heavy morning wearing black and then middle morning wearing gray and light morning wearing light gray and mauve. So people actually knew where you were in your, quote, morning process representing the family so so much protocol and etiquette that we don't have anymore for people to know and understand what's going on with a loss that you've experienced you do mention in your book about our society today that they see grief or the grief process in a different way yeah you say our society doesn't always encourage us to stop and feel our feelings let alone the tradition, right? Talk to me for a moment about that. Why did this happen? How did this change? And how do we learn to feel our feelings? Well, I think it's giving permission. And I think, you know, um, from a patriarchal standpoint, the patriarchy is all about, you know, the masculine force of do, do, do and not stop and think and, and feel. And, you know, I grew up on the do, do, do side myself. So it took a lot of my learning in the last 20, 30 years of really, oh, I, what am I feeling? You know, stop and feel it and allow, it's okay to feel your feelings. So that was the first step. And that, um, not that I didn't before, but I didn't consciously, I was not consciously aware of it. And I think um, we are moving forward into a time where there is a greater balance between the masculine and feminine. You could call it from the patriarchy to the matriarchy, but I prefer, you know, we have both of those qualities within all of us, whether we are male or female. And so it's creating a balance uh, so that we can express ourselves wholly rather than just leading with one part or the other so that we become a greater whole ourselves, which then is a, a better example of living for anyone else. You know, we, I've always believed that, you know, you can't make somebody else do something. You have to do what you do as an example and live your life in that way. Um, even as a mother, you know, the, your child is, is their own individual and they've got their own ideas. So you have to live the expression of who you are and the ideals and concepts and principles that you believe in and, and express that through how you live. I absolutely love your wisdom. Thank you, Miranda. Oh, boy. I uh, see even that expression. Oh, boy. Um, oh, girl. <laughs> Instead, yeah, my daughter, uh, I have to say when my daughter was little, I would notice how uh, I had been so integrated into the patriarchal because I would call her little stuff bears and so forth. He this and he that, and she would go, she. Mm, right, <laughs> so, right. Uh, she was a feminist from the get-go. <laughs> yeah. It got me to be aware of my um, automatic response of saying he, which I would not have noticed before. So, you know, Teachers are everywhere for us to show us we don't notice ourselves. What are some of the main misconceptions about grief? Well, I think the biggest one, as I mentioned, is people think that it's over in a hurry, yeah. you know, and you should be done by now. Yeah. Um, and and I, and I think that it's just not understanding the experience of the emotion that can just arise without you doing anything. It's just something triggers you. And, you know, I, my own little personal uh, research, one gal said after three years after her husband died, she was ready to move on. Someone else said it was five years. Another friend said her mother, um, when her father died, her mother didn't do anything for seven years. And, you know, there's a there's no time limit, but it's just our, our heart is not as tender after the first few years. But I think it's also, um, we, ha we have to remember that 
we can't walk in another person's shoes. And so we can't know what they're feeling and experiencing, and we can only have compassion for them. I, I really appreciate some of the rituals that we do have. I mean, the, the Jewish faith has this wonderful ritual of, you know, sitting Shiva for a week mm. when someone dies so that yeah. they're sharing that grief for a week. And then uh, they have a ceremony uh, of one year, of, of marking one year. Um, and I, I think that all of those things of creating ceremonies are very important and helpful. Um, that's why I have a whole thing in my book about altars, because yeah, an altar, beautiful. creating an altar can be a way to focus your grief and honoring that grief at the same time. Um, one of my friends read my book and her husband had died. And so she created an altar. She sent me a picture and I said, Oh, you should add a candle and you can light it, you know, whenever you want. Mm. She then a few weeks later sent me another picture mm. with a candle and flowers and those photos. And, and she said that, um, she lights the candle every night. Oh. Yeah. And it becomes a beautiful way to honor that grief and focus it in a way that, you know, just is, is so heart um, connecting. And I saw that you also have altars for your cats. Yes. That well, you know, when cats die, there are loved ones too. And I created yeah. an altar for our cats, well, both of them, but I just showed a picture of one. Yeah. You know, because again, they're part of the family, they've been loved, they express love. And so it's, it's uh, really nice to honor them as well when we're grieving them because that's a, that's a hard loss as well for people. What is the simplest way to create them, Miranda? Oh, I love answering that question. Um, create a space. It could be a mantle, it could be a tabletop, it could be the top of your dresser in your room. Uh, I've moved altars around from one place to another, it could start in the living room and then could move to the bedroom wherever. But uh, photos, some photos, some flowers or a plant, a uh, candle, maybe some found objects. I, you know, I've put feathers or heart-shaped rocks on the altar. Um, I think they also evolve. You know, we create one to start with, and then as we as things evolve, I mean, the the altar I made for our cat. Then a friend died, so I put her picture on the altar with the cat. You know, it's love uh, and remembrance. So. Uh, but it helps to have a place to focus that. And it's also a place of beauty. And remember, creating any little groups of beauty, beauty is the highest vibration. So that really um, sings to our heart. And this is another thing you mentioned, um, your biography. You are a event designer. And how did you get into that? How did you discover that talent? Uh, well... <laughs> uh, I grew up uh, cooking and sewing. I thought everybody did till I went to college and found out that wasn't that, that didn't happen. Um, so I have been uh, my, around entertaining, growing up with it. My mother, my grandmother, my aunts, um, all were beautiful cooks and entertainers and making beautiful tables. So I, that was just something innate for me. Um, and I started doing some, helping with some catering and food. Uh, then I ran Martha Stewart's catering business as her executive director back in the 80s, uh, which was a lot of entertaining and designing uh, spaces and food. And then I started my own event management business. So I've been doing it for over 35 years. And what I love is helping my clients think differently about their events because really it's starting with the purpose of why are they wanting to do this and what do they want the experience to be, which is a feeling. It's like, you know, have you ever walked into a, a room that's so beautiful and you walk in and you go, oh, 
This is so beautiful. It feels so good. It's yeah. like when you walk into a spa, yeah. doesn't it feel relaxing? True. They've created that space to feel that. And so you design the event and the space for the experience and the feeling that you want your guests to have. And so that's where you start. And then from there, you build it uh, and put in all the little details that they want. So I love it. I still love it. We're in a, a different time right now where we're designing how to create experience over the computer on Zoom and other uh, venues besides Zoom to create conferences and meetings because that's what we have to do right now. But the principles remain the same. And yeah, they sound really lovely. And that's um, a wonderful work to do, isn't it? To work with beauty and creativity. Uh, and speaking of beauty, flowers, you posed a question in your book and you speak about flowers and that they are sent to the family when somebody passes. So answering that question, why do we send flowers? I would love to hear that. No, we would love to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we send flowers because we don't know what else to do. I mean, I do mention this book. I would love to read this little bit in here if we have time. Because... Okay. Um, it's in this chapter, Why Do We Send Flowers? And it's in a recent Sunday New York Times modern love column, this paragraph jumped out at me. Why do we send flowers? to make up for what is intangible, those feelings we can't hold in our hands and present as a gift to our loved ones? And why is it that placeholders we choose, the dozen red roses, the fragrant white lilies, the long stem French tulips are so fleeting? Hold on to them for too long and you end up with a mess of petals, pollen and foul smelling water. The article was about working in a flower shop, the stories people share when they buy flowers and the variety of messages on the accompanying cards. This note was unusually honest. Cards and flowers seem so lame when someone dies, but we are thinking of you and want you to know. This definitely says what is true. We want to send our love and heartfelt caring to friends and family when they experience the loss of a loved one. And it is hard to know what to say. Flowers say it for us, though not usually with such a direct message included. For me, the beauty of flowers also represents the beauty of life. They are alive, beautiful and ephemeral, a reminder to honor the preciousness of life in each and every moment. Um, so your book, I love the title, but also could have um, had a different title, Recipes for Healing After Loss because you include a lot of recipes, your chef and Mike too. And that's lovely the way you do that. I read that your daughter also, she now makes his uh, scrambled eggs. So talk to me about how cooking his favorite recipes helps to honor his presence in this lifetime. Yeah, well, it's a way to remember. Uh, I had one reviewer actually write about the book that he never thought about cooking and serving the foods of a loved one was a way to remember them. So again, that's an action, you know, what we would call mourning or grieving, an action of where we can remember them and actually remember them with uh, love and uh, joy or the experience that we had with them. And um, I just think, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a chef, so I love to cook and it's creative, but it's also, you know, I learned recipes from my husband that I wouldn't have made otherwise, or, you know, dinners that we made together. It was so fun to be able to um, cook together and entertain so that we were both making things for dinner. And, uh, so it's, it's a way to remember those fun times. It's like the uh, altar that I created just for his um, third, the anniversary of his third, third anniversary of his death with my friend Catherine. And we put out his wine because he didn't get to drink all his wine before he left. And we put out some goat cheese and chutney that I made because he liked that. And we ate it and drank the wine and talked about 
our uh, wonderful remembrances of him. So it was a ceremony. I didn't keep the altar up for a long time, but it was for the ceremony. But again, it, there was food and wine and a way to toast him and think of him and remember wonderful things about uh, our life together. So food, I think, is always a connector. Um, you know, when we sit down and break bread together, it, it brings people together. So um, it does the same, even if they're not here, because we're thinking of them. Um, not the passage, just something I read in your book that caught my attention was the message that was left on your cell phone. Um, there was, let me see if I have it here, I should have. Yeah, there was a few days after his death. So the whisper you heard, I love you. Um, yeah, that gave me goosebumps. That was one of the experiences you had that confirmed his uh, presence in this realm still. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, you know, I had the other one where I went upstairs to our bedroom and it was a strong smell of coffee. Coffee downstairs in the kitchen, you know, and it really again, I started reading some other books about this, that, you know, these are common experiences. And that uh, it does show that they are, they're still around. And I did have several sessions with my friend who was a medium, because I called her right after my husband died and said, how long do I need to wait before we have a session so that he sort of landed? And she said about a month. And that um, he was right there waiting for the session. And it was his assignment. <laughs> that I had to write the blog. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. He had to list 10 things I had to do, but I don't know what I did with that list. And <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do them all, I know, but I did the blog. So there we, here we are. Right. The book. <laughs> right. How about dating after we lose our husbands? Is that something that you ever thought about? Oh, yes, I did. Um, and I, I did date a little bit. I, I found that the, uh, the universe is responsive when we say, when we ask a question. And so I, I got some lessons on that. Um, I had heard so many stories of women connecting with people they knew from college or whatever, and, you know, um, getting together. So I asked the universe, literally, I said, oh, I wonder who that is for me, I said out loud. And then I got a letter from this guy that I was pinned to in college, you know, um, 10 years ago. Um, and I saw him for a while. And then I said to the universe, okay, well, how about someone that is closer? And um, I got a phone call from somebody closer that I almost married years and years ago. Saw him for a little bit, but uh, that was not it. So then I decided that I'd stop asking the universe that question and just put my nose down mm -hmm. and do my work <laughs> <laughs> that is and cute. allow things to unfold and pay attention to my job and my daughter, raising my mm -hmm. daughter and, and not ask the universe these mm -hmm. questions because it like shows up and I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so um, I, you know, the timing is different for every person. So some people, and I think men more than women, get married uh, more quickly than women do, um, just as a generality. But it's for every person, it's different. You know, there's no, again, there's no rules for that. It's just however things unfold and it feels right. So I'm not opposed to it. I'm just not a really good... Um, online <laughs> shop <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's another way you know so many people meet each other online right online dating websites what was the hardest lesson to learn about yourself and life as of today hmm well i think i'd have to ponder that one um i'm not sure that i have a quick answer for that because uh i, I think as i've said before you know Whatever looks hard is only what seems to be hard at the moment. But if we uh, be quiet and listen, there's always uh, an answer for what's next, for what's 
what has to what next steps have to be taken. Um, I I have never been stymied where I think that oh this is the end or some kind of conversation like that. I don't have that inner conversation. But of course I've done a lot of work on my inner conversation. So um, I don't think I I could come up with something because each instance is as again an opportunity for. A greater expression of growth. It's sort of like when my husband died, suddenly of a heart attack, one of my first comments to myself was, oh, widow, I've never done that before. Now I have something new to learn. Yeah. I mean, that could be bizarre, but that's what went through my head because it was something new. If you knew you would die soon, meaning losing the body, would you make any change in your life or do anything in a different way? Uh, I probably get a little busier finishing my event planning book uh, because I have that's what I started writing before the grief train. So I'd want to get that done. It's almost done. I now have to write the virtual uh, online chapter at the end since that's where we are with events. But um, I don't think otherwise I would make any other changes. I think I have done a lot of preparation. Uh, having everything in order, uh, having uh, prepared with trusts and documents so that I'm not leaving a mess for somebody else. I think that's one of the most important things is that we let people know what our desires are and that we have uh, our finances and paperwork in order and our do not resuscitate or whatever medical forms need to be filled out so that uh, we are we are leaving things in order and remembering that again that's taking care of others mm, true. by not leaving them a mess to figure out when should we start thinking about that or preparing uh, papers and all that because we often don't have this conversation when am i going to die we don't actually know when we're going to die but what age would you say? Well, I, I read a book and I'm going to have to find it um, right now so that I can tell you the title because I, I think you have to start way earlier than we think um, to be aware of the fact that it can happen at any time. I mean, I started... Um, you know, with my mother dying at age 10, I started having my own inner conversations about you know, what is death. So that you could say that was early, but that was based on my own experience. And um, I think that we need to be aware at all times. And I think, you know, you never know when a time is going to come to some people's time is shorter than others. So, you know, I don't think we can say you have at age 50, you better have your paperwork together. Well, maybe it should be age 40. I don't know. Um, so I, I don't think we can say an age, but I think we have to talk about awareness and that preparation and speaking about what we want is important at any age. And as I say, you know, studying the 1800s, everybody died at home. So that was a common occurrence. And people talked about death. It was around them. They experienced it. They talked about death. They never talked about sex. Now here today, we talk about sex and we don't talk about death. That's something we have to fix about that. And I absolutely agree. That would be a great curriculum in school. <laughs> Reflections on death. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's so many books out, you know, and I think that um, it's, it's being open to the conversation and having the conversation and bring it up because people skirt it, you know, and then here they are with this COVID, they go in and they, they don't come home and they've never had the conversation. So I think there is no time frame, but now to have the conversation. Another question came to mind before my final one is about children. Do they grieve differently? than adults? Oh, I think they grieve too, but you know, I don't think children 
maybe have all the same inner conversations that we do as adults that we have sort of grown into without even noticing. Yeah. But certainly, you know, I used to, as a kid, crawl my, cry myself to sleep after my mother died, you know. So yeah. uh, I know that, you know, I was sad, and I guess we could call that grieving. Yeah. And then you get used to it, you know, that they're, they're not there anymore. So you're used to them not being there. Um, so I think that kids do... And I think what, you know, depending on their age of how much they understand, yeah. you know, that's the other thing, because at different ages, they have different levels of understanding of that. And my last question is, what are three things about life, you know, for sure, as of today? Okay, well, I'm going to go back and be sort of a broken record, because I'm going to say that, first of all, uh, we're all connected uh, secondly, you know, we are immersed in an energy of light and love. And when we are out of sorts, we have forgotten who we are and that we've forgotten that that's, we are that light. We are that love and that we are surrounded by it, immersed in it. Um, and that, uh, to live life with joy this, I always remember this movie, Michael, um, with um, John Travolta as the angel Michael. And, you know, he's in his last experience on earth and he is sitting out on a field, sitting next to this little dog. And he is looking out and saying, this is so beautiful. I am so going to miss this beauty. What a powerful message for all of us. Thank you, Miranda, for your beautiful presence, peaceful presence, your wisdom, sharing your wisdom, your mission. Thank you so much. Thank you, Valeria. It's a pleasure. Where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? Okay. Well, for my book, you can go to thegrieftrain.com. Yeah, thegrieftrain.com is my website. And then for events, it's mfproductions.net. That's M for Marinda, F for Freeman, productions with an S at the end, dot net. Wonderful. I'll have those links too on your podcast profile. Thank you so much again, and we'll talk soon. Okay, thank you. Bye for now. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Marinda Freeman and her work, please visit thegrieftrain.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.